Uh, Robert's presentation is on the group of uh, somewhat dry and generally little study papers dealing with the origin of life on Earth. Paper 57, The Origin of Urantia. Paper 58, Life Establishment on Urantia. Paper 59, The Marine Life Era on Urantia. Paper 60, Urantia during the Early Life Era. Paper 61, The Mammalian Era on Urantia. Paper 62, The Dawn Races of Early Man. Although the revelators have made it perfectly clear that within a few short years, many of our statements regarding the physical sciences will stand in need of revision. Paper 101, uh, chapter four, paragraph two. These papers provide a fascinating and vital scaffolding for the spiritual message in the remainder of the book. These papers deny fundamentalist dogma, heal the rift between religionists and scientists, and allow all to partake equally in the book's spiritual message. Much detail remains unrevealed so that today's and future scientists may enjoy the thrill of uncovering the true elegance and sophistication of the life carries plan for your answer. Let us now enjoy these papers in uh, pictorial form and explore some of the unrevealed details of the life carriers plans. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do now is, is share my screen for everybody when I talk about these. So it is a pictorial presentation. And so I'd like you to try and maximize the image there so you can just enjoy the images that I've got that correspond with the, um, the, uh, the Urantia quotes that I'll, I'll be reading. So. As Gabrielle was just saying, you can you can just focus on the on enjoying the the pictures and um, and and listen. Actually, <clears throat> it does say that I can't um, share my screen here, Philip. Could you just look into that? You are not a co-host, so uh, you should be able. Okay, maybe you can do it now. All right, let's, ah, that's perfect. Absolutely. Now, hopefully everybody's got a lovely, um, clear, large image there and can hear me. <clears throat> so we're having a look at these papers that are often not studied and are often considered a little bit dry and devoid of spiritual content, but they are a, a magnificent scaffolding um, for us. And so let us begin now. Um, the story of man's ascent from seaweed to the lordship of earthly creation is indeed a romance of biologic struggle and mind survival. Man's primordial ancestors were literally the slime and ooze of the ocean, the ocean bed in the sluggish and warm water bays and lagoons of the vast shorelines of the ancient inland seas. So, all evolutionary material creations are born of circular and gaseous nebulae and all such primary nebulae are circular throughout the early part of their gaseous existence. As they grow older, they usually become spiral. And when their function of sun formation has run its course, they often terminate as clusters of stars or as enormous suns surrounded by a varying number of planets, satellites, and smaller groups of matter, in many ways resembling your own diminutive solar system. Five billion years ago, your sun was a comparatively isolated blazing norm, orb, having gathered to itself most of the nearby circulating matter of space. Remnants of the recent upheaval which attended its own birth. 
the primitive planetary atmosphere of the volcanic age affords little protection against the collisional impacts of the meteoric swarms. Millions upon millions of meteors are able to penetrate such an air belt to smash against the planetary crust as solid bodies. But as time passes, fewer and fewer prove large enough to resist the ever stronger friction shield of the oxygen enriching atmosphere of the later eras. This is now the aptly named Hadean era. All this tremendous activity is a normal part of the making of an evolutionary world on the order of Urantia and constitutes the astronomic preliminaries to the setting of the stage for the beginning of the physical evolution of such worlds of space in preparation for the life adventures of time. So an interesting comment from an early geologist when he wrote to his wife uh, in 1910, he said, looking at a map of South America and Africa, he, he wrote to his wife, doesn't the east coast of South America fit exactly against the west coast of Africa as if they had once been joined? So this is amazing. This was, uh, was not only written in that letter. And um, the, the, uh, the theory of plate tectonics was unrevealed knowledge at the time of the authoring of the Rancher book. Yet what is written in these chapters is most enlightening. The outer crust was supported by and rested directly upon a molten sea of basalt of varying thickness, a mobile layer of molten lava held under high pressure, but always tending to flow hither and yon in equalization of shifting planetary pressures, thereby tending to stabilize the Earth's crust. Now here's our modern understanding of uh, plate tectonics showing 150 million years of movement, 150 million. And the Urantia book says, the continental land drift continued. Even today, the continents continue to float upon this non-crystallized cushiony, cushiony, cushiony sea of molten basalt. And you can see that perfect jigsaw fit and enjoy it. It's truly magnificent. And that time, 150 million years, let me show you on the time scale there. And I'm hoping that you, you can see my, my arrow, but the 150 million years is only the first top two dashes, a dash and a half on the left-hand column here. And you can see the full extent of time on Earth, 4,600 million years. And so that little video clip that we saw is just the tiniest of the last fragments of what's been going on. Just to see that movement, I'll just take you briefly to the San Andreas Fault where two of these plates rub side by side. And uh, we can see clearly what the early geologists of the 20th century, the earlier 20th century, uh, could barely believe but huge land masses grinding against each other. And you can see as the streams cross the San Andreas Fault here, you can see the, their offset in the direction of the arrows. And my cursor, you can see a little person there for scale standing in the background. And that's the offset along the fault. So you can see all the streams running out of the hills, coming out of the background here, they reach the fault line and then all their, all their trails are offset like that. And if you're um, maybe silly enough to have a fence across it or something like that, as happened in, 90, in the 19, um, 1908 uh, San Francisco earthquake, you can see that the, uh, the fence was offset here. And furthermore, when the farmer came out of his, his house, there's the front door. You can see it as dark in the, in the background there. He came down his front steps here and his garden path was gone and he was looking at his 
rose garden here and you can see here the path has been shifted to the left and there it is complete with garden hose um, moved so yes the plates are moving and there's the offset in a in an orange orchard in the imperial valley so um, it is real the plates do move at approximately six centimeters a year <clears throat> now imagine the earth is there and life appears on it and there's no real reason why life should appear um, science can't explain why life should appear on a rocky ball for no reason whatsoever. Um, but as we know, it's really part of the life carrier's plan. So life appears for the first time in the Precambrian Oceans. And there in um, Hamlin Pool, Shark Bay, Western Australia, we do have um, some of remaining this uh, prehistoric stromatolites there. It was these seas and their successors that laid down the life records of Urantia, as subsequently discovered in well-preserved stone pages, volume upon volume, as era preceded era and age grew upon age. These inland seas of olden times were truly the cradle of evolution. All of this story is graphically told within the fossil pages of the vast stone book of world record. And the pages of this gigantic biogeologic bio record unfailingly tell the truth, if you but acquire skill in their interpretation. And here are um, some geologists um, actually standing there interpreting the fossil pages of the vast stone book of world record. And as you can see, you can get your eye into it and you can see differences and you can find different life forms in the layers and you, and you can, with not too great difficulty, read the vast stone book of world record. Many of these ancient seabeds are now elevated high upon land and their deposits of age upon age tell the story of the life struggles of those early days. It is literally true, as your poet has said, the dust, the dust we tread upon was once alive. The trilobites, these little animals existed in tens of thousands of patterns and were the predecessors of modern crustaceans. Some of the trilobites had from 25 to 4,000 tiny islets. And you can see those islets in this example here, those compound eyes. Others had aborted eyes. At this, as this period closed, the trilobites shared domination of the seas with several other forms of invertebrate life but they utterly perished during the beginning of the next period. Lime secreting algae were widespread. There existed thousands of species of early ancestors of the corals. Sea worms were abundant. And there were many varieties of jellyfish, which have since become extinct. Corals and the later types of sponges evolved. The cephalopods were well developed and they have survived as the modern nautilus, octopus, cuttlefish and squid. So ends the evolutionary story of the second great period of marine life, which is known to your geologists as the Ordovician. Towards the close of the Silurian, there is a great increase in the echinoderms, the stone lilies, that's these in the front there. As is evidenced by the crinoid limestone deposits, the trilobites have nearly disappeared 
and the mollusks continue mon monarchs of the seas. During this age, the more favorable locations, in the more favorable locations, the primitive water scorpions first evolve. And that large one is a water scorpion. These developments terminate the third marine life period covering 25 million years and known to your researchers as the Silurian. <clears throat> and it was from such seashores of the mild and equitable climes of a later age that, a, that primitive plant life found its way onto the land. There, the high degree of carbon in the atmosphere afforded the new land varieties of life opportunity for speedy and luxuriant growth. It is the dawn of a new age on earth. The naked and unattractive landscape of former times is becoming clothed with a luxuriant verdure and the first magnificent forests will soon appear. From the briny waters of the seas, there crawled out upon the land, snails, scorpions, and frogs. Today, frogs still lay their eggs in water, and their young first exist as little fishes, tadpoles. This period could well be known as the age of frogs. Very soon thereafter, the insects first appeared and together with spiders, scorpions, cockroaches, crickets, and locusts, soon overspread the continents of the world. Dragonflies measured 30 inches across, cockroaches developed, and some grew to four inches long. Many of the largest true fish belong to this age. That's the Devonian. Some of the teeth bearing varieties being 25 to 30 feet long. The present day sharks are the survivors of these ancient fishes. The lung and armored fishes reached their evolutionary apex. And before this epoch had ended, fishes had, adapt had adapted to both fresh and salt waters. And thus drew a close drew to a close one of the longest periods of marine life evolution, the age of fishes. This period of the world's history lasted almost 50 million years and has become known to your researchers as the Devonian. The Devonian marks the apex of marine life evolution. From this point onward, the evolution of land life becomes increasingly important, with the stage almost ideally set for the appearance of the first land animals. When the seas were at their height, a new evolutionary development suddenly occurred. Abruptly, the first of the land animals, of were numerous species of these animals, were able to live on land or in water. These air-breathing amphibians developed from the arthropods whose swim bladders had evolved into lungs. Two hundred million years ago, the really active stages of the Carbonifer Carboniferous period began. The prolific vegetation of the coastal swamps contributed to the production of extensive coal deposits, which have caused this period to be known as the Carboniferous, and the climate was still mild the world over. The large shell feeding sharks were also highly evolved, and for more than five million years they dominated the ocean. The gradual cooling of the ocean waters contribute much to the destruction of oceanic life. The ending of this great period of biologic tribulation, known to your students as the Permian, also marks the end of the long Paleozoic era, which covers one quarter of the planetary history, 250 million years. 
the rapidly evolving, these rapidly evolving reptilian dinosaurs soon became the monarchs of this age. They were egg layers and are distinguished from all animals by their small brains, having brains weighing less than one pound to control bodies later weighing as much as 40 tons. But earlier reptiles were smaller, uh, carnivorous and walked kangaroo-like on their hind legs. They had hollow avian bones and subsequently developed only three toes on their hind feet. And many of their fossil footprints have been mistaken for those of giant birds. Now the Triassic. This period extended over 25 million years and is known as the Triassic. Later on, the herbivorous dinosaurs evolved. They walked on all fours and one branch of this group developed a protective armor. The Great Cretaceous period derives its name from the predominance of the prolific chalk-making foram foraniferas in the seas. And they're the white cliffs of Dover made up of those uh, tiny foranif for foramiferas. The Cretaceous continued to be preeminently the stage, the age of the dinosaurs. They so overran the land the two species had taken to the water for, substance, for sustenance during the preceding, preceding period of sea encroachment. These sea serpents represent a backward step in evolution. While some new species are progressing, others gravitate backward, reverting to a former state. And this is what happens when these two types of reptiles forsook forsook the land. Their brains weighed less than two ounces, notwithstanding the fact that these huge, huge ichthyosaurs sometimes grew to be 50 feet long. Two other two, um, species of dinosaurs were driven to the air by the bitter comp competition of life on land. But these flying Pterosaurs were not the ancestors of true birds of subsequent ages. They evolved from the hollow-boned leaping dinosaurs and their wings were of bat-like formation with a spread of 20 to 25 feet. For a time, these flying reptiles appeared to be a success, but they failed to evolve along lines which would enable them to survive as air navigators. They represent the non-surviving strains of bird ancestry. 55 million years ago, the evolutionary march was marked by the sudden appearance of the first of true birds, a small pigeon-like creature, which was the ancestor of all bird life. This was the third type of flying creature to appear on Earth and it sprang directly from the reptilian group, not from the contemporary flying dinosaurs, nor from the earlier types of toothed land birds. One hundred million years ago, the reptilian age was drawing to a close. These creatures, for all their enormous mass, were all but brainless animals, lacking the intelligence to provide sufficient food to nourish such enormous bodies. And so did these sluggish land reptiles perish in ever increasing numbers. Henceforth, evolution will follow the growth of brains, not physical bulk. And the development of brains will characterize each succeeding epoch of animal evolutionary and evolution and planetary progress. This period brings Urantia to near the end of the long reptilian dominance and witnesses the appearance, the appearance of flowering plants and bird life on land. So just some beautiful shots of uh, the flowering plants we enjoy today, which came about 
uh, came about in the Cretaceous. Now in, in 1980, Luis Alvarez and Walter Alvarez and Frank Asaro and Helen Michelle came out with a remarkable theory. The era of dinosaurs was ended by an approximately 10 kilometer astro asteroid 65 million years ago, years ago, causing extensive volcanic eruptions all over the planet. And in which event, 85% of life on Earth becomes extinct. So this is a, a truly amazing thing, which of course was discovered after the um, publication of the Urantia book. Because your world is generally ignorant of origins, even phys of physical origins, it has appeared to be wise from time to time to provide instruction in cosmology and always has this made trouble for the future. The laws of revelation hamper us greatly by their pres prescription of the impartation of unearned or premature knowledge. Any cosmology presented as as a part of revealed religion is destined to be, cut, to be outgrown in a very short time. And here we see an example of a detail not being incorporated as marked the very important end of the, um, the dinosaurian realm. We are not at liberty to anticipate the scientific discoveries of a thousand years. Revelators must act in accordance with the instructions which form part of the revela revelation mandate. We see no way of overcoming this difficulty, either now or at any future time. We full well know that while the historic facts and religious truths of this series of revelatory presentations will stand on the records of the ages to come, Within a few short years, many of our statements regarding the physical sciences will stand in need of revision in consequence of additional scientific developments and new discoveries. While divine or spiritual insight is a gift, human wisdom must evolve. So you can see that these three great men would have had great joy in, in developing their scientific understanding and and what a terrible thing it would be if everything was laid out for them in a book um, thus cutting their ability to enjoy um, human the involvement of their human wisdom but nevertheless what is presented to us is extremely accurate and important and important scaffolding this the cretaceous age covers 50 million years and brings to a close the pre-mammalian era of land life which extends over a period of 100 million years and is known as the mesozoic mesozoic by the end of this period the biologic stage is fully set for the appearance in a subsequent age of the early ancestors of future mam mammalian types. And thus ends a long era of world evolution extending from the early appearance of land life down to the more recent times of the immediate ancestors of the human species and its collateral branches. What the... Um, Urantia book did take the liberty to mention was the greatest crustal deformations in millions upon millions of years took place in Mexico. And that is amazing that Mexico, the coastal Caribbean, Caribbean as shown there, was the um, place of the meteorite impact and the, the curved lines there um, are an artist's impression of the curved lines in the now buried geophysical data that was revealed by the petroleum companies. 
These are also the times of tremendous crustal deformation and concomitant widespread lava flows and great volcanic activities. As you can imagine, a meteorite impact on one side of the earth would set the solid core ringing like a bell and create great fractures over the remaining continents of the earth, spilling huge quantities of lava that we see in the geologic record as having took place at this time. Basic mammalian instincts began, began to be manifested in these primitive mammalian types. Mammals possess an immense survival advantage over all other forms of animal life in that they bring forth relatively mature and well-developed offspring, nourish, nurture and protect their offspring with affectionate regard, employ their superior brain power in self-perpetuation, utilise increased agility in escaping from enemies and apply superior intelligence to environmental adjustment and adaptation. Now referring to the dolphin image below, like the land animal, like the land serpents of a previous age, which betook themselves to the seas, now a whole tribe of placental mammals deserted the land and took up their residence in the oceans. And they have ever since remained in the sea, yielding the modern whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals, and sea lions. About this time, a notable thing occurred in Western North America. The early ancestors of the ancient lemurs made their first appearance. You can hardly realize by what narrow margins your pre-human ancestors missed extinction from time to time. Had the ancestral frog of all humanity jumped two inches less on a certain occasion, the whole course of evolution would have been markedly changed. The immediate lemur-like mother of the dawn mammal species escaped death no less than five times by a mere hair breadth. Margins before she gave birth to the father of a new and higher mammalian order. A little more than one million years ago, the Mesopotamian dawn mammals, the direct descendants of the North American lemur type of placental mammal suddenly appeared. They were active little creatures, almost three feet tall. And while they did not habitually walk on their hind legs, they could easily stand erect. They were hairy and agile and chatted in monkey-like fashion. And here we see the, um, the, classic, the classic diagram that we, um, that we know, sometimes brutalized in this form. And, um, and now I, I come to the second part of this presentation in the next, um, in the next half hour, and I'll get through as much of this as I am able in the given time slot. But I want to have a look at some of the mechanics, the detailed mechanics of this evolution we were going through, the, um, some of the unrevealed detail of God's mass, grand master plan, the life carrier's work, and look at some of these different evolution, divergent evolution, convergent evolution, adaption, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, camouflage, etc. So I'll do that. Um, uh, if anybody has any questions as we go, as we go um, at this stage, please let Philip know. Otherwise, I'll just, um, I'll just continue here with um, some more wonderful images to look at. Now, 
the continental land drift continues, you can see the continents there stuck together. Notice South America, North America, Africa. That's a triple junction where they come apart. You can see the Florida panhandle just sticking in between, in between the two. It's quite marvelous how it works. The, um, the area on the bottom, which you can see breaking up, shows that the, the, the bottom part of the continent was all stuck together and life was suddenly separated on three separating rafts 150 million years ago. And that's very interesting. Again, I show you that 150 million years is a very short time on that first column there, marked by the yellow arrow at the top. It barely touches the top of Earth's timeline. But in that 150 million years, you've got this type of evolution happening. So the Panthera um, genus, that was a common ancestor, a big cat living on that, um, that continent, that single continent before it split into three. And in 150 million years, evolution has taken the great cats into um, separate genuses, Leo in Africa, Onca in the Americas, and Tigris in Asia and India. And it's interesting, these, these are different species. You can clearly see they're the same thing, but 150 million years has separated them to the extent that they are different species. And that means that they, they, cannot, they cannot reproduce at all or very well between them. So why has this happened? Why have they become so different on the different continents? And that is, that is a function of evolution. They've, they've adapted into their environment wherever those continents took them and whatever plant life developed. And you can see the tiger. Well, you can't see the tiger in this slide barely because its evolutionary development, its striping and its color has rendered it um, practically invisible, which is highly advantageous to them as a predator. They could come upon you in complete surprise and you would never know about it. And there's the leopard. Now, <clears throat> the way the pattern of evolution, the way it works according to the life plan, the life carrier's plan, you can see that here is the forelimb of a bunch of different, completely and incredibly different things um, that you can see. And the forelimb of the human on the left, you can see the different bones and they're colored, which are the same bones and then the forelimb and then the fingers. And you can see what particularly has happened to the fingers, whether they've extended or whether they've, whether they've fused as the case of the horse or their, their beautiful dexterous fingers in the case of the human. And the modification of the plan is quite easy. You can see, you can see here the bones hidden inside the flesh are really all the same. And there's the whale's flipper. Look at, look how similar the whale's flipper is to a hand, except the finger joints have become modified. And then the whole lot, all of the five fingers have been sort of covered together with a, a, a cartilaginous uh, flipper. And the same with the bat, the fingers have become extremely long and they allow the, the, the flexible membrane to stretch and allow the mammal, the bat, to, to fly. So what a beautiful thing it is to have a master plan and just allow genetic variations of it that can happen snappingly fast in geologic time to enable animals to adapt to their environment as necessary. Here is, was um, Darwin's uh, observations. He observed that the, the, um, the, uh, the honey creepers, the Hawaiian honey creepers and the, and the finches on the, on the um, oceanic islands, they were the same thing really, but their beaks were quite different, having evolved to the food type. 
the one at the top there in uh, Kauai, you can see the long thin beak enables it to enter deeply into a flower, whereas the one next to it on the on the uh, on the left, the Kona finch, <coughs> well, it can crack seeds with its big strong stout beak. So these things happen relatively fast in geologic time. And have a look at this one. There's the woolly mammoth and the elephant, very similar indeed, but the woolly mammoth is ice age adapted with a lovely fur coat. The humans too. Here we see uh, Homo neanderthalis and Homo sapiens, the two um, species or subspecies of human. And you can see the, uh, the Neanderthal is, uh, is ice age adapted, being beefier, thicker, and uh, with a lower heat loss out of the body. That was uh, divergent evolution, where animals adapt to their environment. Now, on the other hand, convergent evolution is interesting. It's where different animals have the ability to adapt to an environment and come in from different backgrounds. So you've got birds, mammals, and reptiles, completely different um, creatures. But in this case, they've been, they've, they've been driven to the air by environmental factors, and they have developed the ability to fly. So their form is similar, but their structure is, is completely di um, different. So that's called um, convergent evolution. So again, it's really amazing how the mechanism worked. Another form of convergent ev evolution is the, the uh, adapting for the return to life in the oceans. And you can see the Kronosaurus here. Um, again, the, the finger joints and the arm joints are fused into flippers. And the same with the dolphin, as you saw in the preceding slide, where the, where the fingers and the hand um, bones that we have free as fingers have, have merged into a flipper for uh, rapid, for ease of swimming. Now, mutualism is the interspecific cooperation of two organisms of completely different species or even different kingdoms as the case of this bird and flower. You can see the bird is adapted to the flower and the flower is adapted to the bird, needing the bird or insect for its pollination. And there is the insect uh, now pollinating the flower. And here we've got the Egyptian plover cleaning the Nile River crocodile's mouth. So, I mean, who would go into a crocodile's mouth? But only the Egyptian plover knows that it's safe going in there to provide a surface service, which is picking out bugs and uh, food scraps and other things that would otherwise um, cause the the Nile River crocodile problems, dental problems or parasite problems. Here the oxpecker birds are on the, um, the impala and just sitting there cleaning ticks and the impala of course is very pleased with the service. Now here's a very interesting one, the adaption to the polar regions. This is camouflage now. So both the predators and the prey species here have adapted white. The prey species, of course, to, uh, um, to escape the predators who, who will use the, their white background as, as camouflage. So that is an amazing thing. The polar bear's fur is, um, is thick. It's got a fat layer. It's well adapted to the, um, the Arctic environment. Sometimes, of course, the camouflage doesn't work. As you can see in this case, they, they actually lose their white fur in the, um, in the summer. Now, camouflage here with the orchid mantis, and I bet you you can't even see that there's a mantis sitting on that orchid, but it is, its head is here. You can see the two eyes and the top of the head and then it's four legs, 
which would grasp any unsuspecting insect that came into that orchid and its, its body and hind legs going back. That is a very amazing thing when you think about it, that that specific camouflage, plant specific. The blue poison dart frog, on the other hand, is as obvious as you can get. And, uh, and why is that? Well, it's actually advertising its presence because if anybody's stupid enough to grab it, like a snake, it'll writhe in agony after getting the toxins in its mouth. So the, um, the blue poison dart frog makes it a point of being as, as obvious and as bright as, as it can be. Now here's a fascinating one. This is called mimicry. And up top there, you've got the venomous Mayan coral snake. So of course, again, no bird would go near the venomous Mayan coral snake. And below it, you have the non-venomous false coral snake, which is a completely different family of snake, completely different family order, um, genus and species belonging to the order of snakes. But, uh, but amazingly, this completely different snake over time and by selection of all its contemporaries or mates being eaten that look less like the venomous snake, the non-venomous one has come to look identical to the venomous one, which means it too is not eaten. Now, here's an absolutely fascinating one. This is the snake head caterpillar. So what you're looking at here, the snake head, is actually the tail of a caterpillar which you see up the top there grasping the the plant stem so of course nothing's going to uh, to eat a caterpillar looking like that in the next one you can see more obviously that it isn't a snake it's a little bit stumpy and you can see the um the front of the caterpillar yet the processes of evolution have enabled this caterpillar to develop such a realistic snake head, even with almost the uh, reflections, the reflective eyes, reflective glow off the eyes, to make such a realistic head that that caterpillar is protected from being eaten. And uh, interestingly, many caterpillars have done this, even though some of them less effectively, this one looks more like a blow up pool toy. And perhaps these ones look a little bit funny, like uh, kids blow up pool toys. But nevertheless, this, this camouflage has affected, has, has developed on, on, the, on the tail of these snakes, of these um, caterpillars, to prevent them from being predated upon. Um, the Amazon electric eel has developed a way of um, using electrical discharge to locate itself in the muddy waters of the Amazon or Orinoco rivers where its eyes are virtually useless. So this near blind eel uses electric pulses to navigate. And of course, that's uh, become a defense mechanism. Low be, low be, low be betide anyone who dares grab one of these things. And the camouflage, perhaps the most amazing thing you can see here is the way that octop octopus can do this and adapt into their environment and become practically invisible in the, in the third frame over there on the right. And the way that this happens is that um, they can compress their cells and the melanosomes, these black spots, which otherwise obscure everything below them, are drawn into the, the center of the, the cell. The cell kind of collapses, as you can see in the, in the top of this image here, um, putting in the, uh, the melanosomes into the middle and compressing the thing. And when that happens, the other colors show through. And the different layers can compress differently. So by having the primary colors in there, you can actually get every single color of the rainbow. And here's the classic uh, chameleon walking across a pair of 
different coloured plastic sunglasses, and that is just truly amazing. It's an automatic process. The chameleon's not planning this, but it, as it walks, it just adapts itself um, to the environment in which it's on. And so it can do this, of course, it can you do this to attract mates and, uh, and, and to, to display anger and thin, things like that, or just to, um, to camouflage itself in the, in the, against the background. So really, that has to be the most truly amazing thing that one could ever imagine, this kind of process. And again, in the chameleon, it's the same thing. You've got the primary colours and they can control them individually to make any colour that they want. Now, I'm coming out of time here, but I will stop shortly. I, I love the human, the human colour pattern on the globe. And you can see that the longer the humans are in the tropical regions where the, um, where the sun is very strong and damaging to the skin, there they are, the, the humans. 300,000 million years, 300,000 years of evolution make them perfectly black where they need to be. And in the, in the Mesoamericas, which have only 10,000 to 15,000 years, they are um, a lighter color. And of course, where the, the skin needs to be as light and as transparent as possible to absorb the sun and, and utilize vitamin D, such as in the, the very north of the, um, the Arctic regions, practically, the, uh, the skin has to be lily white there. And, and of course, those people are an abs absolute disaster in the tropical zones where, where freckles and cancers develop. So it's, it's truly amazing what, what the, uh, the evolutionary plan is allowing to happen. And there's a, a wonderful artist's work of gathering the, um, the colours of different people and projecting them on their, their background colour uh, as a wonderful um, Pantone uh, artwork. So, um, the majority of inhabited worlds are peopled in accordance with established techniques. On such spheres, the life carriers are afforded little leeway in their plans for life implantation. But about one world in 10 is designated, oops, is designated as a, and I'm just missing that word, as a decimal planet and assigned to the special registry of the life carriers. And on some planets, we are permitted to undertake certain life experiments in an effort to modify or possibly improve the standard universe types of living creatures. And that they have done on our world. And I think a fitting place to stop is horizontal gene transfer. And, and this is so puzzling as to how this evolution can even, given the depths of human time, can go so quickly. But now, uh, it has very recently been discovered that bacteria and possibly more things, viruses, etc., can uh, transfer information and you can see on the top one you can see the um the donor bacteria that has an evolutionary advantage in its in its genes and that's that little red the little red one um number three labeled number three now um number two the, the, the next one is has has does not have that advantage so when the, uh, the first bacteria joins with the second one with its pilus, you can see it actually is transferring that advantage as you go down the diagrams into the receiver cell. And lo and behold, the advantages conferred by years of evolution are immediately transferred to another individual. Now, is this good? Yes. Well, perhaps it can enable uh, things to evolve quickly as anticipated by the life carriers, but perhaps we can have problems like the Zika carrying mosquito, for example. Now these, these examples do completely away with the creationists arguments for God creating everything in its, um, in its place and designed perfectly 
things like the Zika carrying mosquito, the E. coli bacteria, um, the Ebola virus, for example, all of those, um, they, they adapt extremely rapidly due to the same processes of evolution that allow everything else to evolve in a positive direction. So yes, there are problems for the life carriers. Years and years of evolved antibiotic resistance transferred to other, other individuals, for example. However, the life carriers, well, we won't read through this whole thing, but they have to take their renunciation vows. They have to um, just watch and perhaps weep as all of the things that they didn't want to happen, happen. But nevertheless, evolution has to run its course and, uh, and it's such an interesting thing. So I'll have to stop there. My time is up. We won't be able to go on, but, um, but it's such a fascinating thing. And scientists of today have this, um, this wonderful opportunity to, um, to acquire wisdom and knowledge. In a, in a very beautiful way. So um, thank you very much, everybody. And, um, and we'll, we'll finish there. Wow, thank you, Robert. Very yeah, good, Mike. That's incredible. <laughs> what, a way to, what a way to be educated on evolution, a la Urantia book and um, modern day science. It's incredible. Well, it's, it's such a wonderful pictorial way to do it. That, um, that I think, you know, it's just, it's a really, it's a good way to see pictures as well as read the words. That's, that's my feeling. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it makes it really interesting. Very, very well done. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Hey, well, are there any questions uh, from the audience or? <clears throat> Stop sharing, Robert, so we can see each other. Now, how do I stop sharing? Just help me do this. Uh, up the top. Up the top, you should see, if you hover your, see what it just says, stop sharing. Let me try and get rid of this, this slideshow here. Um, oh, hang on. Hover, hover up the top and just click on stop sharing. And oh, then it doesn't... I've got it. You did it. <laughs> I've got it, I've got it. Um, let's see. Um, have I stopped sharing yet? Yes, you yes. have. Oh, fantastic. All right. I turned it off. Oh, Philip did it for you. <laughs> so, quick question. So, how many slides are left uh, of your presentation? Oh, heaps. I'm sorry. Um, the, the, slides, the slides in the following question talk about um, the, the recent discoveries which tie in with the movement of the humans from the cradle of civilization in Africa as based on um, genetic testing uh, of many individuals. Um, and it's quite a fascinating thing. Genetic testing, I'll just mention, it's only about $70 now. Familytree.com or Ancestry.com uh, have this and you can trace back with autosomal DNA. I, I don't have time to, that's in the later slides or your sex DNA, your Y DNA, or, or the mitochondrial DNA of the female cell, you can go back to the primordial Eve, which or Adam, which existed in Africa 230 to 300,000 um, years ago, and follow those waves of migration, and you can follow your own particular wave. It's really fun, and I recommend, I recommend it. Thank you. Um, somebody in the chat was uh, asking uh, if we can have the pictorial presentation. Somebody from um, uh, Hannah, Quadrospedia. And, so, and what did you say? Sorry, I couldn't hear too well. He wants to have uh, the presentation or... Um, oh, look, that's, that's easily done, I think. Um, but it's available there on, on, on the website. Yes. Do you have a website link for us then to uh, put it in the chat? Yes, I, we can organise that, can't we, Kathleen? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just move my computer up to a table. That's the one we've got on the Anzura site. Is that right, Robert? That's right. Okay. I can find I'll it. For it, and I'll get the link and put it in there. And I've also got it in PDF form, and I guess PowerPoint, which I'm using, is a little big. PDF is smaller. Yeah, I'll get the PDF. Okay. While um, Antonio takes over and gets on with the next stage. Yes, indeed. I want to thank the Australian hosts for doing a wonderful job. Uh, it's up to the Europeans now to take over.